Welcome everyone. We are so delighted to have you. We're just going to take a minute to have all of our attendees join us and then we will get started. Okay, we'll wait just another moment and then we'll get started. I'm seeing we have quite a few participants joining us this morning, which is very exciting, obviously a very exciting moment. So we'll get started in just a moment. Good morning and welcome. We are so delighted to have such an incredible program this morning. I'm Dana Steiner. I'm the director of AJC Access Global, which is our Young Professional Division for the American Jewish Committee. And we are so excited. While we're not able to have our official global forum in person, we are excited to have this pre-global forum program, which was supposed to be in Berlin, but it feels appropriate that we'll be talking about happenings in Europe. Um, so we have been hosting a number of remote access programs, and this is really the culmination of, of quite an exciting um, and really transformative moment for how we engage in our leadership development and in our, our, our advocacy work. So I really couldn't be more delighted to have these incredible guests with us today. So as you can see, we have uh, Jesse Eisenberg, Bella Ramsey, mm -hmm. and Jonathan Jacobowitz. So before we get into their bios in just a quick second, I want to just share that the reason why we're here today is to talk about their phenomenal film, Resistance, which came out in March. And we couldn't be more excited about uh, the discussion of the film and about the urgency of Holocaust education in 2020, as well as film as a medium to combat anti-Semitism. So for those of you who have not yet seen the film, Film, the film is a promising medium which reaches wide audience to educate about the Holocaust and honor the stories of those who suffered. Resistance is a new film that tells the story of aspiring actor, Jewish actor I should say, Marcel Marceau, who before becoming a world famous mime, joined the French resistance and saved thousands of children from the Nazis. So a little bit about our guests today. Jesse Eisenberg is an Academy Award nominated actor and acclaimed playwright and author. In Resistance, Jesse plays the French mime, Marcel Marceau, in the incredible story of Marceau's time in the French Resistance. So thank you, Jesse. We also have Bella Ramsey, who made her professional acting debut as fierce young noblewoman Liana Mormont in season six of Game of Thrones, a role that quickly became a fan favorite and saw Bella return for the next two seasons. Thank you so much, Bella, for joining us. And last but not least, we have the director of the film, Jonathan Jacobowitz, who is Venezuela's most celebrated filmmaker and writer, whose film Sequestro Express was nominated for Best Foreign Film at the British Independent Film Awards and was a New York Times critic pick in 2005. Jonathan is also a Polish Jewish, Jewish descendant. So before we begin talking a little bit about the film, I would be remiss not to mention the incredible connection between the film and our very own AJC CEO, David Harris. So as many of you may know, David has two cousins, Mila and Emmanuel Racine, whose work in the French Resistance was uh, actually uh, loosely based on the characters in the film, uh, Mila and Emma. And while the lives of Mila and Emma diverge from uh, what is portrayed in the film, and I don't want to give anything away for those who haven't yet watched the film, um, their heroism and bravery is captured so, so brilliantly. So Jonathan, I want to first uh, turn it over to you and, and Bella and Jesse, please feel free to, to hop in if you would like. Um, what inspired you to share this story? There are so many stories of heroism and bravery um, in the Holocaust, but, but what was it about the story of the French resistance and Marcel Marceau that stood out to you? Well, um, thank you for having us and thanks everyone in, in your audience for, for joining us for this conversation. Um, the, the first thing 
that got my attention was that I I knew about Marcel Marceau. I saw him perform when I was really young, but I had no idea, first of all, that, that he was Jewish and definitely not, a, not an idea that he was a war hero. And the notion that such an important figure in, in the history of art could have done something to, so great got me really curious. And I was able to track down in Paris, George Schloinger, who is the first cousin of Marcel and was the head of the Jewish Boy Scouts of France during the war. And I was able to meet with him when he was 106 years old in his apartment in Paris. And he completely remembered this whole story. And a lot of what you see in the film came directly from his testimony. And after hearing that, I felt that this is a forgotten story that needed to be told. And and it was such an inspiring group of people that decided to take responsibility and do everything to save the lives of children that I I felt I could not do anything else before I was able to tell the story to the world. And, and that's that's what I did. So it did start in Paris. And... And, and this is where we are. Unbelievable. And we'd be really interested to hear, what was the inspiration for the characters of, of Mila and Emma? They play a pretty significant role. Um, and while the, the actresses are, are not able to join us, I think, you know, for the personal connection, of course, we'd be curious to hear what inspired you to really tell this story and to share these stories of these these two women who are, are played as sisters in the film well the you know when when you start doing research about the heroes of the resistance the story of, of emmanuel and mila immediately pop up you know not only because of the how effective they they their work in this network was but also because of how tragic their their death was and and you know I, I i i was just really inspired by their story and 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 their names and how they how close was their involvement to that of marcel you know they specifically did what he did in in you know bringing children to switzerland um there was a law in switzerland that you they were not receiving refugees but if you were able to get a, a child into switzerland and he claimed asylum, the Swiss would not deport him. And that's how the, the Jewish Boy Scouts of France decided to try to smuggle as many kids as possible. And they were working with the, with the Save the Children Foundation. Mm -hmm. um, and they ended up saving 10,000 children during the war. Many of them gave their lives in this effort. And, and Emmanuel and Mila were, were one of those who, who gave their life in this effort. And I just felt it was, it was the right thing to honor them. It's such an incredible story, and it's so beautifully captured in the film. I think at the end of the film, actually, there's a note that the film is dedicated to the over 1 million children who perished, Jewish children who perished in the Holocaust, and the 1.5 million other children, those with disabilities, um, gypsies, those who were also killed. So it's such an important uh, honor to really to, to to share the stories of these characters and the work that they did to, to protect those who were most vulnerable. So we're really so grateful for for being able to hear that story. So I, I want to turn it over to uh, Jesse and Bella, our our actors in the film. So as actors and artists, you have this remarkable ability to inhabit the characters that you play. What was the experience like of inhabiting these specific roles? Was there a sense of responsibility or even nervousness in, in telling this story? Um, should, I, should I start? Um, okay, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, the sense of responsibility I had were like multiple. Number one probably was the fact that I was playing, you know, the world's greatest mime. You know, I'm already a, a Jewish person, so like I knew, you know, and I have very similar like ancestry to Marceau. Our father's family come from like, probably an hour and a half away from each other in southeastern Poland. And so um, I felt like I had <laughs> that part covered, but uh, I had to, um, you know, uh, yeah, take months and months of mime classes to try to, you know, at least get as good as I possibly could. And then um, in terms of like the stuff you were talking about before, you know, in terms of like the historical, you know, kind of responsibility we have, you know, um, uh, you know, one of the things that was kind of like crystallized for me was um, 
the last scene of the movie, which I'm not giving anything away, uh, but uh, takes place um, in, uh, at this kind of Congress hall in Nuremberg. And we were filming um, this scene in a, in a kind of, um, in an arena that was not yet finished um, by the Nazis. And it was built for rallies and Nazi rallies and it was not finished, but it was kept there and it's now a museum in Nuremberg. And we were filming this scene and, uh, and in the scene, Marceau was performing mime for American troops. And as we were filming in this place that was, you know, to be completed alongside the destruction of the Jewish people, and neither one was successful, not the, mm -hmm. the, uh, the Congress hall was not built and the destruction of the Jewish people was not successful. So I don't know, it occurred to me that there was this kind of beautiful confluence of like history and art and my personal family history that uh, made me feel like the story was a kind of wonderful end to the cycle of you know, brutality that was started, uh, you know, or at least not the end, but a beautiful end point for uh, something that had been started 70 years prior. Absolutely. And that last scene is really incredible. Um, we see, I'm not giving anything away here, but um, just the, the look of people's faces um, and the ability that art has to translate sometimes things, miming is wordless. And there's something about that power of being able to translate the experience um, through, through art and through performance. It was really remarkable. Um, oh, yeah. Bella, I'd be keen to hear your perspective and your experience as well. I mean, I think true stories always mean more, like especially a story like this. And if I'm right in thinking, Jonathan, like Elspeth was based loosely off your aunt, uh, which I think gave it, it, obviously that's very personal. So I felt definitely a sense of like wanting to make sure I did it well. Uh, it didn't like completely mess it up and do it justice because it's such a bad, it's such an important story and and it needs to be told so I wanted to make sure that certainly my little part of it was done like the best that I could do it um, and uh, I like preparing for it I guess I just tried to immerse myself in Jewish culture obviously I've, I've learned about it in school um, but I think it's one thing to learn about it in school and then one thing to actually, I don't know, I felt like I was almost an honorary Jew for the time that we were filming because I was so immersed in it, which was like a privilege actually. Yeah, I just, I, I loved it. I think it's such an important story and I'm really glad that I got to be a little part of it. Amazing. Well, you are certainly an honorary Jew in our eyes and we're happy to have <laughs> you in the community. So actually, okay. Bella, I want to pull out something you just shared, which is that, you know, you learned the history in school. Um, and for many children, they learn the history of the Holocaust. Uh, however, you're a European teenager. Um, and what we do know is that there are fewer and fewer numbers of, of young people who are familiar with the history of the Holocaust, with the stories. Um, Two thirds of young people don't know what Auschwitz is. Uh, that was an article that was recently pulled in the Washington Post. So what do you feel is your role in speaking out against anti-Semitism and really ensuring that this story is one that is told. It's, it's really something that as a young person, there's a tremendous amount of power. So what, what does that mean for you? I think it's uh, about setting an example. Like we're all influenced in one way or another by literally everything that we see, especially with social media now. So I guess it's uh, just using the platform that I've been blessed with to speak out against any form of injustice or anti-Semitism or prejudice whenever it rears its head. And, and actually just encouraging people to love each other more and mm -hmm. accept people no matter who they are, where they're from, what their beliefs are, because actually if everyone did that, then there wouldn't be so much hate and discrimination in the first place. So I think I, just about being an advocate for that as much as I can and representing that and making sure that the film gets shared as much as it, it can so that people who don't know about the Holocaust or, or don't recognize that it even happened that they will and that they'll see and that they'll feel that this actually is a very real thing with real trauma and pain attached mm, so just so that like nothing like that will ever happen again I think that's why it's so important that it gets told and so that people aren't in denial of the, of history absolutely. and to make sure that like with the history in mind that we go forward to, to make a better future Absolutely. That's so important. And thank you so much for, for sharing that. Um, it's important that we talk about things uh, 
being more public and that we want to prevent these atrocities from, from happening again. So we're now 75 years after the conclusion of World War II and of the Holocaust. And unfortunately, we are seeing unprecedented spikes in anti-Semitism. In France, where the film takes place, um, we have an AJC office in Paris, and we, we conducted a 2020 study on anti-Semitism in France. And it indicated uh, some really shocking statistics that both Jews and the general public identified anti-Semitism as a serious problem in French society, and that one out of 10 French Jews have experienced violence on several occasions, and 84% of the younger generation, aged 18 to 24, are more likely to have suffered at least one anti-Semitic act. We know that many French Jews don't feel comfortable being identifiably Jewish, um, and that's something that's really interesting in the film. There's a lot of um, moments where the characters are wearing explicitly Jewish garb, whether it's a kippah or tzitzit, um, and that is something uh, that's very striking, that many French Jews now don't feel comfortable wearing um, these kinds of clothing or, or sharing their Jewish identities at work. And as something that Jonathan and I spoke about, more than one out of two French Jews have already considered emigrating from the country. So taking stock of this data and these statistics, what is something that you hope, and what is the messaging that you hope the film uh, brings to European audiences? What was your experience of filming in Europe? You spent nearly two years in Europe filming this experience, and Bella, I know you're from Europe. Um, but for those who are not, what was that experience like? And how was the filming received? How was the experience of sort of being in the place where this trauma existed? Jesse, you want to start? Um, okay, yeah, I mean, well, yeah, I mean, it was, well, that's, there's uh, many things you bring up. Uh, <laughs> one, the first thing that occurs to me is that, you know, uh, I, yeah, I, I, I understand what the statistics you mentioned from France. I mean, it seems to me like tribalism is on the rise everywhere and divisiveness is on the rise everywhere. I suspect, yeah, anti-Semitism in France, uh, yeah, it might be, uh, yeah, particularly emphasized now. I mean, um, I'm in Indiana where um, my, uh, yeah, my wife's, the synagogue where my wife went to when she was young was, uh, there was an attempted bombing and a defacement while we were shooting this movie. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, but I'm also conscious of the fact that other groups are experiencing rises in, in uh, prejudice as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, and uh, look at what's going on uh, in America right now. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I'm sensitive to that. And I try not to kind of, uh, I try not to kind of focus so much on uh, the Jewish experience as much as the experience of us at large now and people who are uh, let's say progressive and open to multiculturalism versus people that are not. And I tend to view it in that binary rather than the binary of uh, Jews as victims and other people as perpetrators. Um, that's my background and perspective. In terms of shooting um, the movie, it was, uh, you know, it was an unusual experience to be doing a kind of movie about, you know, Nazism in Munich. Um, and, uh, and, you know, normally when you're doing a movie, you kind of spend the weekend not thinking about, let's say, the heavy themes of the movie. Um, but in this, it was impossible in, in a good way because it was interesting to immerse oneself. Um, you know, on the other hand, and kind of on a more hopeful note, you know, um, you know, I had a bodyguard while we were in, while we were shooting. This guy was like six and a half feet tall, this huge German guy, Jan, um, you know, the most intimidating looking man you could, you know, kind of imagine. And at lunch uh, one day on set, maybe on the the fifth day of set early on into shooting, we were talking about the history and he kind of started talking about um, his family and how his grandfather ran a power plant in a small town in Germany. And because his grandfather was irreplaceable as the only person who had to run this kind of, um, you know, uh, uh, antiquated power plant, um, he was able to save Jews without, uh, without any kind of punishment because he was necessary for that plant. Um, Jan and I spoke at length for months, so, so, you know, this was a story that kind of came up various times, but it occurred to me that, you know, as many, for as many, uh, you know, horrible incidents that we read about and that we should be kind of thinking about and trying to stop, there are also people like that who kind of go unheralded, who, uh, you know, are doing the right thing in quiet ways and risking far more than I am as a Jewish American kind of reading about it and horrified from afar. Mm -hmm. It's its own quiet act of resistance in many ways, um, which is pretty remarkable. Um, 
amazing. Uh, Jonathan or Bella, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts as well. And thank you, Jesse, for that really thoughtful response. Well, I can, as far as, you know, being visibly Jewish in Europe, um, I can tell you a quick story. My wife was wearing a Star of David in Munich in a store and the owner of the store started asking her, why are you wearing that? And, you know, my wife gets freaked out thinking she's about to be a victim of anti-Semitism. And it turns out that the woman in the store was Jewish. Mm. And she thought there was no way a Jew would wear a Star of David. You know, so she didn't think my wife was Jewish because she was wearing a Star of David. You mm. know, it's like a Jew would know better. <laughs> that, um, I, I can I can also tell you we were in a public swimming pool in in Germany and this guy you know came in I'm with my daughter and my wife and everybody's having a good time and the guy suddenly takes off his shirt and his entire back is tattooed with the word Aryan mm. um, and you know he was with a group of neo Nazis in the middle of a swimming pool in Germany and nobody said anything you know it was there were hundreds of people and nobody said anything most people rather avoid a problem with a guy who clearly would love to get into a fight so is it is you know a thing that is back it's rising you know i think it's obviously incomparable to what they were going through in the 30s um but you know i i think it's it's um and it's gonna get worse now because it was rising with a booming economy right now with after the epidemic it's going to be horrible how minorities are blamed for absolutely everything. And, and I think the, the key is to be, to be proud, to be strong and to support each other. You know, it, it, you don't think that when, you know, black people are being persecuted, it's not about you as well. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's very common to, to, you know, trap yourself into the bubble, like, you know, that's not against me, but it, it's always against you, you know, it, it doesn't matter how white you think you are, you know, people think that to, people are now calling Jews white, you know, I mean, it's very clear that traditionally, when things get ugly, Jews suddenly are no longer white, you know, so it, it it's very important to to be vigilant of every sort of discrimination and to be active and you know regardless of of those scary numbers i do think we may be the luckiest jews in history you know at the end of the day we have very strong institutions like yours who are you know making sure that anti-semitism is is under control and it's been defeated and we have a strong state that you know worst case scenario we can always run to and it's um it's a privilege that no other jews in history have had and and but that also is a responsibility and mm -hmm. we have to you know make sure that, that things stay stay you know in a more in a civilized way especially in a moment where civilization is you know falling apart slowly and, and everywhere around the world. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And you really raised something that's so important. And one of the things that we're so proud of in our work with AJC is that we have a number of intergroup and interreligious inter coalitions because we realize that we must continue to advocate um, for those who are equally as vulnerable. Um, and it's something we're quite proud of with our work with our Muslim Jewish advisory councils, um, with our Latino Jewish advisory councils, with those with our Black Jewish uh, leadership work we do. We were uh, foundational in helping to found the Black Jewish Congressional Caucus, um, or reviving it, I should say. So we are really, we really understand that and speak to that. And I appreciate your, your sensitivity to that as well. Um, Bella, do you have anything you'd like to add to sort of, uh, to, to finalize that question? Um, I'm so immersed in like listening that I've kind of forgotten what the question was. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's really, um, you know, as a European, um, you know, we, many of us, uh, as a part of the AJC community, are, are based here in the United States. Jesse's based here in the States. Jonathan, while you're not originally from the States, you're from Venezuela, now you're based in California. Um, you know, there is a difference of sort of understanding the relationship between the Jewish community and um, with its, its complicated history in Europe. Um, so I suppose a, a reframing of the question is, 
um, what was it like for you to film in Europe as a European, um, but also with recognition that there are challenges, ongoing challenges uh, between the Jewish communities in, in Europe, what does that sort of responsibility look like to continue to advocate um, in light of these challenges? I think filming wise, it was definitely, yeah, like Jesse said, you definitely felt a lot more connected. So normally it's just like a studio or a hut in the middle of nowhere, but this was actually had some weight to it and some connect, like some connection, like directly to the story, which made it definitely more immersive, more har more harrowing in ways too. But um, but I think it really helped with the authenticity of it. Mm. Uh, it was, I mean, there's some beautiful locations, but it's it, I I find it crazy how like places that are so beautiful have such atrocious history mm. kind of attached to them. So that was a, a weird combination as well. Absolutely. And I think, of, of course, yeah, it's, there's still so much prejudice at, with all, of all forms with anyone who's slightly, it's like people are allergic to any sort of difference, mm -hmm. which uh, is obviously, we're still progressing. So I think it's about just building up that tolerance and acceptance of people. Yeah, I mean, of course, and, and recognizing what's going on and not ignoring it and not turning a blind eye and just pretending it's nothing and, and making sure that, yeah, we all, and I think film is a really good way of doing that as well, actually. Yeah. Because it, that that forces people to actually feel, I think, not it moves past head knowledge and goes kind of deeper than that. Uh, so I think that's, I think it's a really good medium to, to be able to change perceptions and, uh, yeah. Absolutely. Well, you stole my last question, which is actually quite helpful. Um, so before I sort of dive a little bit into the last question, I want to remind our audience that if you have questions for uh, Bella or Jesse or Jonathan, so please use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Um, and we'll hopefully have time for one or two questions before we wrap up. But if you have questions for Bella, Jesse or Jonathan, please use the Q&A function and hopefully we will be able to share one or two of those questions. So my last question, which Bella so perfectly um, segued into is about the usage of film as a medium to not only discuss Holocaust education, but also to really discuss some of the more complex and complicated and challenging um, things that we experience in our society and our history. So Resistance did a beautiful job of really translating this story through gorgeous cinematography, through amazing uh, filming. How generally do you feel, especially in these polarizing times, that art and film and performance, playwriting, can, can serve as a medium to not only educate, but to inspire action in these challenging times? Um, or the first thing that occurs to me from your question is that um, we, uh, there is an unusual amount of like, um, the. There's a great amount of there's a greater ability to be didactic with one's opinion now because we uh, live in a uh, because because we um, because the technology allows uh, opinions to be discussed with just great pedagogical dogmatic uh, opining you know where you could you know where we kind of expect every known person in the world to have a feed where they constantly espouse their political beliefs um, I think in a way it ends up. I think it ends up just creating more divisiveness and doesn't really accomplish the thing that people think it's accomplishing, which is, I guess, trying to sway others to one's opinion. And so in that way, I think like art and stories, um, because they're kind of like, you could argue softer forms of propaganda because they humanize characters, because they uh, couch political dogmatism in the form of stories, beautiful cinematography, attractive actors, you know, in some cases. Um, no, I mean, not in my case, in some cases. I mean, um, I mean I'm more known for my uh, uh, great charisma. But, um, uh, you know, I mean, you know, um, music. And so in a way, um, you know, but, but, that, but the positive side of that, propaganda is a negative, uh, has a uh, negative connotation. But the positive side of that is that you can have a movie about resistance, you can have a movie like Resistance. And I think it's far more impactful, uh, a kind of, condemnation of hatred than uh, somebody ranting in a speech. Uh, it humanizes victims and heroes in a way that is really compelling. 
and uh, nuanced and, um, and probably more influential than any kind of dogmatic speech. Mm. Excellent, thank you. Jonathan, Bella? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with I agree with what Jesse said. I, I do. There's something about the luxury of, of narrative and storytelling and fiction. You know, I mean, there's still yet to be found a more influential book than the Bible. You know, and and the Bible doesn't give you values; it tells you stories. You know, and 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 those stories give you values but the focus is always on the stories and and that has proven to be the most effective way to communicate ideas and and i i do think it, there is so much noise and so many people you know imposing their ideas and their vision that fiction also gives you um, a certain level of protection where you can simply engage with the feelings of the characters and you know, you start you start giving a speech about a group of Jewish Boy Scouts who saved children in the Holocaust, and everybody tells you, well, "What about police abuse? You know, why are you talking about that?" You know, but with the luxury of of film, you know, you can be part of the conversation about police abuse by making a movie about French resistance. You know, so it's um, I think it's a it's an enormous privilege and and we are lucky to have been able to make a film like this because it's also not easy you know it's it's easier to make a movie about a guy robbing a bank mm -hmm. um but you know when you see the all this the the controversy with gone with the wind you know how everybody so many years later are discussing if the movie should be shown or not be shown and, you know it, it it only speaks to the power of of values communicated through storytelling mm -hmm. and and i can i can tell you right now as a latino um in 20 years people are going to be apologizing for narcos and all this series about narcos and all that mm -hmm. stuff and they're not going to be able to believe that they were able to green light those series at the same time while they were you know denouncing gone with the wind it's just that latinos right now are not even considered you know a group of people mm -hmm. but it, it's um it, it's very powerful that that storytelling consistently can give you values and and if if you're able to to connect with an audience and we were lucky to to be able to with this film is is an enormous privilege that that we should we treasure and and that i think you know should be encouraged because it's still the most effective way to make a difference and to change people's minds mm. thank you Jack. I definitely agree with all of that. Um, and I think from, for people like my age, from my generation, like, it, like I said before, it's like one thing to learn about the Holocaust, uh, like on paper in a textbook at school where you're bored already. Um, and it's another thing to like feel it and respond to it. I think that's where film comes in. And that's, I think that's why the, there are so many films made about it as well, because it, they can subconsciously have really powerful change because uh, suddenly we empathize with them because they're people centered. Mm. This is the thing like in, in textbooks in school, you don't learn about people, you just learn like facts and events. But I think as soon as it, they, they, like uh, Jesse said, it humanizes it. As soon as it becomes about people, suddenly we, we empathize and we feel. So I just, I hope that anyone my age who does watch, uh, resistance actually feels and responds uh, so that it doesn't just become a textbook event that they learn about in year eight but that they mm -hmm. they actually recognize it as a thing and and respond and speak out against anti-semitism or anything like that whenever it comes up again yeah i think film is just just yeah just like stories it's a powerful medium definitely and it's accessible and everyone can watch it mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think you raise a really interesting point, Bella, which is that, you know, in history books, we talk about places and things and often the people that we hear about might be only the people who had that platform at that moment. And we have to think to ourselves, how many stories are untold, right? How many stories have we not heard? How many stories of resistance or bravery or heroism or courage are not shared because they were done quietly or because they were done in a different way. So it really makes you think 
uh, sometimes it's these kinds of mediums in which we can share these stories that aren't typically shared. So really, I, I appreciate that thoughtful response. So we have a, a little bit of time left to take one or two questions um, from the audience. So this first question um, comes from uh, Jessica Krieger in Miami. So Jessica asks, what was the most meaningful film for you? Uh, excuse me, what was the most meaningful scene for you to film without giving anything away? Um, was there a particular moment in the film that just really spoke to you and really connected you, not only to the character, but, but really really spoke to you? Oh, well, okay. I, can, I, I can give you one with Bella and one with Jesse. Right. <laughs> I think uh, the, the opening scene with, with Bella was very, very personal to me. We were um, living in Munich, three blocks away from Hitler's apartment. Mm. And it was me, my wife, and my daughter, and we say Shema Israel in the exact way that the the man, the, the wife and his daughter do it in the film. You know, it was, we were literally living every day a replica of that scene in an apartment where we went down through, through, <clears throat> through a set of stairs that were, that looked exactly like the ones in the film. Mm. And, you know, it just, it was inevitable to feel that that, that could have been our story. On top of that, you know, Elspeth, uh, my aunt is the person who inspired that story. So it felt very personal. Mm. And um, and with Jesse, you know, there was, you know, the scene that Jesse mentioned when, in the place of the Nuremberg rallies, of course, was extremely powerful. But also there was a scene in, when they are under the bridge and, and Jesse and Marcel is talking about what is resisting, you know, and, and, and the debate between resisting with violence or resisting to help people survive. We were shooting that the day after the attack on the Pittsburgh synagogue. Mm. Um, in the tree wow. of life and you know you, you had you know two Jews in Nuremberg of all places shooting a scene about resisting anti-semitism the day after Jews in America were killed in a synagogue wow um, it was just incredibly powerful and and it really felt like what we were doing had you know a meeting that was bigger than us and and I'll never forget that moment wow wow absolutely um, I'll speak to that same scene, but with a slightly different um, side anecdote, which is that uh, we filmed that scene where the characters say that the best way to resist is to survive. You know, they're discussing the best way to um, spend the war. And, uh, you know, their options are, uh, do we try to kind of hide and pick off one Nazi at a time? Or do we try to save children that we know are in need urgently? And they decide to, to save the children. And Jonathan puts it so beautifully that the best way to, re to resist the Nazis is not to kind of pick them off one at a time, but to just try to get these kids to survive. And um, like a, a few days before, I had taken my one-year-old son to Dachau concentration camp. My wife and I went and we took our kid because, you know, uh, he was obviously too young to remember anything, you know, so we just thought it would be, a, um, you know, he, he wouldn't obviously know what he was seeing. And uh, he was, he, I was carrying him through and we were on like a tour and then he jumped down and he started running around like where the barracks were, where the barracks had been and where they were overgrown now with grass. And uh, I, you know, was, was kind of paranoid that he was, because he was laughing and running and I was chasing him to pick him up and we were, you know, chasing a kid around, you know, Dachau. Um, and I thought, you know, it would upset people because it's a, obviously a solemn place um, and the burial, you know, and a, and a cemetery. Um, but then somebody kind of looked at, at him and w was smiling at me, you know, and uh, it occurred to me that was the, the exact message of the movie that, you know, the best way to resist is to survive. You know, it occurred to me that while my kid was like laughing on the barracks where they tried to destroy his, all of his, let's say, <laughs> grandparents, cousins, um, you know, it occurred to me that, uh, uh, you know, nothing would be more upsetting to the Nazis if you told them that, you know, in 70 years, there's going to be a year old Jewish child running around laughing at the place where you tried to destroy them. And um, I think it spoke to the reality of the message in the movie, and it spoke to the kind of bravery of the characters and the savviness of their humanity. Wow, that's such an incredible personal story. And I suspect that for, for many Jews, that is, that is a 
a challenge. That is an experience. Um, I know for many who have been to the Holocaust Memorial in Berlin, where it's not sort of explicitly stated as being such, it's such an odd um, juxtaposition of life and also uh, of death. And I think that you um, really framed it so beautifully. So, so thank you, Jesse, for that. Um, Bella, please. <laughs> I think uh, the one that Jonathan mentioned, definitely that first scene. Um, I, it's, it's the only scene in my life that I've ever analysed. So the, the night before we were shooting, I, I sat at, in, in the place where we were staying in the apartment and I like I wanted to do it right because I knew it was like an important scene. So I sat there and I analysed the scene, analysed the heck out of it. Uh, it came to filming and all of a sudden it's like I couldn't act anymore. <laughs> it's like it just wasn't working. And I remember feeling quite uh, frustrated because I didn't feel like I was doing it well. Um, but, uh, and I realized that was because it was almost like I'd, I'd thought about how I was thinking rather than just thinking it and feeling it. So then it was like moving past that ridiculous analyzing, which is fine for some people, but doesn't work for me. Never analyzed a scene since. And just like, being and feeling and that's when I really connected with it that's when I that's when it felt meaningful mm. and I mean it's it's an atrocious scene uh so it was just feel like feeling that it was I that was one of the first scenes that I shot as well so that kind mm. of set me up for the rest of shooting and mm. if ever I needed to get back into that sort of headspace I'd, I'd remember that scene I'd remember what it was like to to see what happened happen um, and that kind of immediately got me back into the headspace of Elspeth. Wow well you were incredible in that scene um, and it really is in the first four minutes of the film it really sets the tone and it was extraordinary acting um, so Thank really you. you did such an extraordinary and remarkable job. Um, Jesse I feel like there was something you maybe wanted to add um, if I uh, cut you off before. <laughs> no 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 I completely finished my thoughts. Okay, <laughs> wonderful. Um, so with that, I realized that we're almost at time. Um, there were so many really great questions um, that came in uh, about, about the film, about this incredible work, and um, we'd be happy to share some of those questions um, in any sort of follow-up, but really, we want to thank you so much, all three of you, for, for spending your, your morning and for Jonathan, a very early morning <laughs> with us um, to talk a little bit about this film, to talk about the extraordinary work that you're doing and uh, the incredible responsibility that each of you takes in telling this phenomenal story. We're so grateful um, and uh, really just thank you. Thank you for spending your time with us. Um, for those who are joining us, thank you for joining us and spending your time with us today. Um, we hope to see you at the Global Forum, which virtually kicks off on Sunday. It's going to be extraordinary. And we look forward to discussing uh, these kinds of topics and more in the Global Forum. And with that, uh, take care and be well. Thank you, everybody. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you.